is the Big Book Step Study Workshop. Welcome. Um, we are not your traditional, oh, my name is Kimberly and I am a recovered alcoholic. And this is not your traditional Big Book Study. Uh, we take a deep dive into the Big Book and we hit on the highlights and main points. It is Tuesday today, so we're in steps one, two, and three, uh, and we'll be carrying on where we left off last night. Uh, we only have two rules here in the Zoom room. Rule number one is if your video is on, please make sure your clothes are on at all times. And rule number two is please act loving and tolerant and friendly to all in the chat and appropriate on screen at all times, or you will need to be removed. Um, we'll turn it over to Joe to start us off with the set aside prayer. Thanks, Kim. My name is Joe, recovered alcoholic. Oh, I open up this meeting is with the set aside prayer. Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my illness, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Tony? Right on. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My name is Tony. My sobriety date is April 8, 1989. Through the application of the principles in this book, it's connected me to a power greater than myself that enables me to experience a daily reprieve from the illness that's killing a lot of people today. So I'm very grateful for those that went before me and learning this language. Um, my first introduction was to AA was in 1978. Um, it took a, a little while before I, I got a responsible member who 12-stepped me into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I learned this language. Um, anybody ever in some chat rooms here? Anybody ever go in some chat rooms of, of, of the fellowship of people supposedly in AA and, and all that other stuff? We see there's a lot of different language happening in, in the fellowship nowadays in, in, in regards to people's understanding and experience. How many people would kind of found that to be true? We get a lot of different ideas, opinions, and a lot of different kind of uh, um, stuff that's not really based on anything. Was one of, what I like to do sometimes is these ideas that fly around the fellowship. I ask where they come from or what the basis of it is, and is it in the big book? And a lot of people usually defer or stay away from that conversation after that. So we're on We, we Agnostics tonight. And, and th this is probably one of the most profound alt shifts in our thinking in regards to what's being presented here. Um, because by this stage of the game, we have our own ideas on spiritual principles, God, and, and terminology like that. Anybody here? Anybody have their own ideas of what spirituality is? Anybody ever come into the fellowship and say, we need to get find this God or this power and start thinking what that looked like before understanding what it, what, what it is they were talking about. I remember sitting in a meeting and everybody said you had to get these spiritual principles. And I used to start thinking right away what God was and all my teachings from people uh, that went before me in the different uh, sectors of religion and stuff like that. And by the time I finished thinking about these spiritual principles and what it looked like and what my life looked like, you know, sitting in that meeting for about 10 minutes of thinking, I used to think, what an order. I can't go through with it, right? Everybody would put all these stipulations around behavior, spiritual, you need to act spiritually, you need to do this, you need to do that. Anybody ever hear that stuff? How, how they address our behaviors around, oh, look at that person. They, ca they call themselves sober. What kind of program do they have? You ever hear people talk like that? It's like th this, they, they talk about how well you could demonstrate this thing or show like you have this thing will determine whether you have it. And they talk about something totally different. So when we got to page 44, how many people got their books here? And you might want a, a piece of paper beside you with a highlighter and a pen, and you can revisit this stuff later. But it's really interesting that the book so far has, has been what? It's been educating us on what the problem is and what the solution is. And it started talking about certain terminology and certain ideas. Have, how many people kind of picked up on that? Right? If you get involved, you kind of put up your hands so I see that we're kind of participating together, right? So a lot of these ideas and terminologies, before you got into this process... Were you of the same type of thinking? Did you have these, this understanding and these terminologies and this kind of understanding of alcoholism and, and the recovery process and what it is, the, the solution that they talked about and certain terminologies in regards to our illness? How many people had that, that 
uh, that kind of uh, um, dialogue happening in their lives before reading the book. So, so as we started getting into this thing, right, right at the beginning. So, if you could imagine that if everybody here was never in, in, in contact with AA, hypothetically, and then somewhere along the line, somebody said to you, hey, you know what, I hear there's this new thing happening where it helps people like you, and somebody introduced you to the idea that there might be help for you, and they said, well, where's that? I said, well, we could write and get this book. We can get this book sent to us in the mail. C could you picture that? So if we all got this book in the mail together and we're all talking about it, would we all have the same idea and same information as reading it in our homes, as those that put this together? So, so we see, but the benefit of that is we wouldn't have any outside influence. We wouldn't have the treatment centers. We wouldn't have the recovery houses. We wouldn't have all these books or all these other ideas influencing our education on what we're reading. We'd be reading it firsthand. And so when we kind of started this thing, we kind of, we'd open the book and kind of, if you kind of went with me and opened the book, you saw Alcoholics Anonymous. Then you open the first page where it says Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how many thousands of men and women who have recovered from alcoholism. You kind of go, wow, hmm, isn't that interesting? So what is, so right away it kind of tells you there's hope for people who have this affliction. But what is this affliction consist of? I know I have problems in my life, but I don't really understand why it is I keep doing the things that I do and why it is I can't stop myself from doing them. So I'm, I'm investigating some form of solution or finding out education why that is. Would you kind of agree that that's why you'd get this book? So right off the hop, we see that it introduces you to the idea that there is a solution to a dilemma that you may be or may not be suffering from. Even if you're reading this, that you knew somebody that was afflicted with a drinking problem, that you would go, well, there's hope for my brother, maybe my mom, my wife, my husband, or whatever. Does that kind of make sense? So right off the hop, we see that this whole thing is solution-oriented. It starts off with the idea that there's hope for this thing, which is pretty cool when you kind of look at it, right? Then as we started going through this thing, we kind of read the end of, we get to the preface, preface, and then right here there is a brief history, but they tell us what the first portion of this volume is describing. Right off the hop, they're telling us what, the, what type of book this is, right? And what type of book is this? It's a basic text, right? And so if you understood textbook, what you know, is, is the passing along of information, which is really interesting. And so what does this kind of textbook talk about? So why don't you hit us up on that, Kimberly? Because. Because this book has become the basic text for our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recovery, there exists strong sentiment against any radical changes being made in it. Therefore, the first portion of this volume describing the AA recovery program has been left largely untouched. Okay, in awesome. So, in four editions, they haven't changed this thing. So that means if you're coming to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous or, or online or anywhere looking for a solution to a dilemma that you may have, this is what we have to offer. Do we have anything else to offer as a solution to your dilemma that we endorse as a program of recovery? Does Alcoholics Anonymous has anything else that it endorses as the solution to alcoholism? So they're saying when you come here, this is what you should be getting. This is the first introduction that you should be getting. And, and what happens is, is we, we have a, a lack of good sponsorship happening in a fellowship. We're getting away from the book and we're getting into these feng shui ideas that are not book based. And the only people that really suffer from that is the alcoholic who's coming here looking for a solution to the dilemma. Because the non-alcoholic, potential alcoholic will be able to stay sober that we discovered going through this. But the actual alcoholic with hardly an exception will be able to stay sober based on self-knowledge how many people found that to be true how many people's relapsed here right and even including when you were trying to get sober on your own before coming a how many people relapsed here how many people found they couldn't stop drinking based on their own experience 
Well, right away. So if you're able to stay stopped, would you be looking for a solution to a, a dilemma that you've... So we see that these ideas that are being passed around the field are really not concrete on anything. As we go through this forward to the first edition, we find out what kind of text this is. It has a program of recovery in the basis of it for those who have recovered from alcoholism. So what's the first section here forward to the first edition? talks about who put this thing together. Well, who put this thing together that the fellowship uses as their manual or their itinerary or their guide to access this program of recovery laid out by the founders who put this thing together? They put this message in the book so we wouldn't garble it or, or, or misconstrue it or kind of anybody ever sit in a circle where they do that, that thing where they whisper in one person's ear this, this story? And then they tell another person, tell another person. And by the time the story comes back to you, that person get your help, somebody killed them and blah, blah. It's a whole new story. Anybody? And it's not the story you started with. And then you read actually what the story says. And then somewhere along the line, people changed it a bit based on what they were hearing. So you think that would happen in the fellowship of AA? Most people who get 12-step and are not book-based get a version of what they think this is. And so what they, they do the verbal intellectual approach instead of the book-based approach. And those who are have good sponsors will kind of right off the hop will introduce you to this thing. That's the whole point of sponsorship. And working with others, they ask you to give your prospect or the new person this copy of the book and read it, right? And then ask them if they want to go through with it and you'd be available to take them through it. That's the only purpose of a sponsor. Interesting, right? So if your sponsor hasn't gone through this, can they take you through this? So how do you know, like all these new people coming into the fellowship of AA, how do you know if you got a good sponsor or not? If they're not using the book, if they're not using the book and could show you what they're talking about, maybe they're a good friend, maybe they're a mentor, but are they a sponsor in, in the kind of, uh, and the way that 12 step talks about having had a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps. Are they that kind of sponsor where they pass on this message, the collective message of those that put this thing together? It's not singular. If you're still having a singular experience or your sponsor is passing on a singular experience, then they're not carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. They may be carrying a message. They may be trying to be helpful. But our job is to introduce people to what when they come to AA is the program of recovery. The message. That's why we read how it works. That's why we read the preamble. So if you want to know if you're having good sponsorship or not, your sponsor will be taking you through this. They'll be saying, hey, have you read this yet? Do you understand who put this together like we're doing now? They'll go, hey, have you read this yet? And we'll go, well, let's go over it together. Kimberly, what does it say here? Who put this thing together? We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Okay, so right away, how many people put this together? Is it one person or is it a collective? It's a collective. So that means they all agree on what the problem is, what the solution is, what the course of action. They put their collective experience in this basic text. That would be a useful program for anybody who may be afflicted with alcoholism. Pretty interesting, right? So if I'm taking you through this as they did it, would it be a collective experience or a singular experience? It'd be collective. Would you get the same experience as I did and as they did if we did exactly what they did? If we follow the same manual that they put together, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. That means this is something that I, is my truth. In the last 31 years, I've never met anybody who's ever gone through this and maintained it who's ever relapsed. I've been involved in AA since 1978. I got introduced to this program in 1989 through a member who said, Hey, Tony, let me introduce you to something. And he never kind of did it that way. He conned me into it. But nevertheless, it was the first time he introduced me to this manual. He guided me through it. He explained it to me. I did what they did. And I've been sober as the result of the application of these things ever since. To duplicate, they talk about that later. To duplicate with such backing is only a matter of willingness, labor, something like that. Along those lines, right? Of, of doing this thing. So, assumably hopeless state of mind and body. What is the purpose then? 
To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So is that open to interpretation? No. If you're using language and terminology and ideas that are not based in this, is it our program of recovery? Is it your program? Then does it become your program and your message? There's a big difference. Our job as responsible members is to carry this message, not my message. Right? Not to change things. Not to. And the best way, to, if somebody gives you some advice to say, hey, just surrender. That's all you say. Oh, awesome. I'm, I'm kind of new. Can you show me where it says that as the solution to alcoholism and Alcoholics Anonymous? Can you show me where it says that? Can you show me acceptance that fixes my problem in regards to alcoholism? Can you show me that? That meeting's maker's maker. Can you show me that? Because my life depends on it. And everybody in my life is really hoping and praying that I don't have to die an alcoholic death. So what you're telling me is, is that if I do what you're saying, right? Or, or, or is it better yet, can you show me what you're talking about so I can show somebody else later? Because if I don't get this thing, I can't afford to die. And the people around me don't want to see me die. So the message you're carrying to me, does it have depth and weight? Or is it just something that sounds good? Is it podium speaker meeting talk? Does it sound really good? Or is it based on something? Or in response, it's based, it's good, show me, precisely. Please, show me what you're talking about so I can show somebody else. And you'd be amazed how many people can't show you what they're talking about. Interesting, right? Because if you've gone through this, can you show somebody else what you're talking about? 100%. Do you know, have to know exactly what it is? No. It's, it's kind of like when you're driving in a city and you've only been there for a little. You say, well, I know if I go down this street that there's an SO on this corner and, and there's a Safeway on that corner, then I'm supposed to turn left there. And then as time goes on, I know, well, that's main and second. Then you could, so does that kind of, then, then you get more familiar with the term and the language, but you know this is the way to go. So right here they're saying this is the way to go, that they found a solution to this thing that's kicking your ass. And we're going to use our own terminology and our own language to explain this. And we all talk like this. This is as we understand it. This is our terminology that's found in here. So they started off with the idea of a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Do I understand what they're talking about yet? No, that's what this text is about, is to educate me as I go along. Is, is Remember, like in math class, you go into, anybody remember actually showing up in class here? You show up, you get the, this big math book in front of you, you open it up to the middle, you go, holy shit. Anybody ever open a math book and go, what the hell is that about? Well, what an order. I can't go through with this. Back to the schoolyard. <laughs> Anybody got a light? <laughs> no. <laughs> we're we're going to do math. <laughs> Deduction. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we got a two, four. There's six of them. No, anyway. So, so they talk about here. Continue reading. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. So if you do what they did, does it become collective? Do you become a part of the collective? So you're connected. So we see who's really sponsoring us when you kind of look at this. Who's really sponsoring us then through this thing? They are. My sponsor is guiding me through it to make sure I'm picking up what they're putting down. Making sure I'm hitting the right notes. Right? It's kind of teaching me, hey, you know what? Are you on, is like kind of on the phone. Are you on your way here? Yeah. Well, what are the, some of the things you're seeing on the path? Yeah, yeah, okay, you're on the right path. That's the purpose of a guide. They're, we're using the GPS, which is the book, but the sponsor is kind of like, hey, did you do this part? Did you do that part? Do you understand this? Hey, when you get past here, we're going to slow it down a bit because this corner is a little tricky. Does that kind of make sense? And that's the whole purpose. So precisely what I'm teaching is what they're talking about. So really, those who sponsored me was the first 100 men and women. And if you want what we have, not what I got, I'm still trying to get rid of some of the shit I got. Anybody here? Anybody? Huh? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyhow, moving on. So we, 
we see a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So when we got introduced to the doctor's opinion, it was pretty, pretty amazing stuff here. Because he says he witnessed something that happened in his facility in, in the treatment of his clients in regards to alcoholism. That most of his clients of this certain type were dying of alcohol, were beyond his reach, were beyond his scope. And he witnessed this person upon his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas that he put into practice. His third treatment, his third treatment. Are we picking up on that terminology? His third treatment, right? We see that this was Bill Wilson. Right? His inability to get sober. Upon his third treatment, a responsible, what we would call a responsible member, now 12 stepped him, sold him on the ideas that it's possible that he may be able to obtain this thing if he did the same thing he did. Bill became sold with the idea that yes, it was possible that he would get this thing if he did the same thing he did. Does that kind of make sense? So, the doctor witnesses, as we went through the doctor's doctor's opinion, there's a couple highlights here we've covered in great detail. He noticed that these people that recreate their lives, the message had to have depth and weight. Had to have something that moved into the core of our being and went past our intellect. That this message had to have depth and weight. And then he went on to say that these certain types of alcoholics keep on going back to drinking in spite of their desire not to and their firm resolutions not to. Any firm resolutions here? Anybody make promises? Anybody like believe it would pass a lie detector's test? He noticed this in 1934 in his treatment specialized in alcohol and drug addiction, it's, which is really funny. What just kind of finished in 1934 that he has a treatment center specializing in? Prohibition. Kind of funny, eh? <laughs> My wife pointed that out. She thought it was a... She goes, isn't that funny? You guys started AA when Prohibition was lifted. I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Anyway, she's a normie. Eh? That's the way they think. <laughs> okay. So, he goes on to say, he talks about the first symptom in alcoholism, which makes sense to us, is the allergy. He labels that as what? The allergy. And he goes on to explain that the only solution that we have for these allergic types is entire abstinence. But there's another problem that he talks about, that there's something that happens in their mind. He's, he's soft peddling this idea that we build on here, right? And the idea that he talks about here on XX Roman numeral 24 is, is that we have this kind of like this human dilemma that we can't find an answer to. So something clicks in our brain where we return to the idea of the ease and comfort, the sense of ease and comfort of taking a few drinks. Anybody have that perplexity here? So we can't find the, the solution to self. Something in self says, hey, I know what will make you feel better. The same thing that had you puking and shit in your pants two weeks ago, all of a sudden you think is going to make you feel better. The thing had you in jail, losing your job, the thing you had puking so much that you beg God that if you ever stopped anybody here in this crowd. I remember this lady once, God bless her, <laughs> I won't say who it is. She was pu she was vomiting, she lost her teeth in her in 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 the toilet and she asked me to get them for us. I said, no no, you're mess, you get them. <laughs> I don't know why I went there. But anyways, we end up in a lot of trouble. How many people end up in trouble in situations that normal people don't end up in? If a normal person ended up, if I eat anything that caused me the same kind of grief, like say if I eat green beans that caused me the same kind of sickness, anybody wake up in the morning, you're so sick, you got the bucket beside you, you're dying. You're dying. You're begging God like never again. Never again, like 15 years old, never again, anybody. And somebody goes to hand you a shot and there's no way you're drinking. Just the look at it makes you sick. Remember that? And then it's not long before you welcome that drink and you thank them for having it in the morning because it takes care of the shakes. And it's it, pretty interesting, eh? How, how this thing. So we see that he talks about is that these people don't have alcoholism. Alcoholism has them. Because they're in conflict. And this doctor sees that these people are in conflict with the life that they want to live and the life that they are living. And they're perplexed with this thing, why it keeps happening. And he witnesses that they talk about here, and we'll talk about here, drinks what they see and what they take impunity. You want to light that up, Kimberly? Uh, yep. Start from drinks which they? Yeah. All right. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Without consequence. Mm-hmm. 
after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree. Anybody need that explained here? So we see something happens in their mind. It makes sense for them to take a drink because they're looking for a sense of ease and comfort. They trigger the phenomenon of craving, right, which makes them drink more because they can't control the amounts they drink. Then there's going to be consequences. They see others drinking with impunity, meaning they can control the amounts they drink. If you can't control the amounts you drink, you're going to do stupid shit. Any witnesses here to that? That's why they call it impaired, the inability to think straight. Anybody ever think they're not driving their car tonight? I'm never going to drive my car tonight. And then you're too drunk to walk, so you drive your car, and it makes good sense. Well, I can't walk home. <laughs> There's no rushes running. <laughs> and, then you drive, and then your helpful friends teach you how to drive the car. Well, keep one eye closed. Follow the line closest to the ground. Keep your hands on the bottom of the steering wheel. That way when you're not off, because when you drive with your hands on the top of the steering wheel, you're not off, the car moves. But if you keep your hands on the bottom of the steering wheel, when you're not off for a second, your car keeps going straight. Like, helpful friends. These are people that really love you. Right? And then you wake up in the morning, you think, I'm never doing that again. Like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. Anybody have that I can't believe story here? And you're going to watch it now. You're going to watch. You're on your best behavior. And then you forget. Anybody forget here? So then what happens when we forget? They go through a well-known stage of a spree. Any spreers here? <laughs> okay. With what? Emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. So, right? Any firm resolutions here? What about you, Eric? Hey? Huh? Yeah. yeah, never doing that again. Sunday, I'm never doing that again. Friday, what am I never doing again? I forget. I'm the, I was, there was something I wasn't supposed to do again. Oh, I know what it was. I wasn't supposed to do those consequences. So if I don't drink the tequila with the microdot, and I don't drink with those people, and I don't go to the gas works, I won't get in that kind of trouble. Because it wasn't me that got me arrested. It was those people. I was standing there minding my own business. Anybody ever standing there minding your own business? Yeah. Any, any blackout drinkers here? You ever come to talking to somebody, and they're asking you what the hell's the matter with you, and you kind of go... I, I'm not too sure. I'm just getting here myself. What happened? <laughs> and you, anyways, firm resolution not to drink again. Anybody wake up with people that, that, that was enough to get them sober for a little while? We're not going there. Anybody wake up with you and you got them sober for a little while? So as we see, it works both ways, right? The shit that happens to us is amazing. And it's like, oh, never again. So... This is happening in 1934, and we see it still happening today in a lot of people's lives. So what? how long does this go on for, Kimberly? Um, this is repeated over and over, and unless this, this person, person can surrender, find acceptance, think it through, go to a meeting, just not do it, have enough. Wouldn't there be a list of things here now that we hear in AA? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't surrender come right in here unless these people could surrender? Unless these people go to, go to church? Unless these people go to meetings? Unless these people behave themselves? Unless these people think it through? Unless these people hit bottom? How, how many hear that list of shit that we hear in AA in regards to people getting... This is the doctor that fortified this thing by putting his message in the beginning of the book. This is what he witnessed working in his treatment center for people who were dying of alcoholism. If there was any other solution, he would have mentioned it by now. Wouldn't he have? This is serious. Because some people who don't get this thing, it is there's two talks in AA. Anybody know the two talks? Is the one you're going to give at your first year cake and the one we're going to give at your eulogy. Two talks happen in a and believe me i've given enough at eulogies and put it together in aftermath talk to many of parents talk to brothers sisters families when you've been sober enough and work with a lot of people there are the most heart-wrenching conversations you can have is to talk to somebody's mother who's been whose son or daughter was sober for a little while and no longer here try to explain that how we don't work we work 
but we have a specific message, and this is the message carried right from the doctor's opinion right to where we're going and we agnostics. Don't worry, I know where we're at. I'm building this up, right? I'm building this up. I've been on the, those pages for the last couple days. Somebody has got to pay. Somebody's going to pay, and I'm sorry, it's you people. <laughs> because I want you to make them pay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Somebody's going to get hurt real bad. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. That's it. No door number three. If you don't get this thing, it's just a matter of time before you're drinking again because what's the first step promise? We're powerless yeah. over alcohol. It's just a matter of time before you drink again. Three months, six months, four years, five years. There's going to be a time where you'll find yourself drinking again and wondering how it happened. Anybody here? The only thing that saves us, us type of people, not all types of people in a our type of people. When you find out what type of alcoholic you are, there's only one thing that saves us from ourselves, and that's an entire psychic change. Nothing else. And he witnessed this in Bill upon his third treatment. And then he goes on to explain what this looks like once it happens. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. Right on. So they talk about, we're going to think about it again, but there's, there's a shift in our thinking that the rest of the book is going to build on these ideas. One is alcoholism, why people are doomed to an alcoholic death. And what is this psychic change of spiritual experience that they're talking about? They're just starting what this... Dr. Witness. So if we want to jump right over to more about alcoholism, because we've gone through this over and over and over, but we'll start, start a page. So we know the first symptom in alcoholism is the allergy. We'll go to page 23, and we'll find out what the second symptom is, is the malady that centers in the mind. There's only two symptoms in alcoholism that this book talks about. One is the allergy, the body, and the condition of the mind. Right, and they call that the malady, and they find that on page 23. And they use certain terminology in regards to this. Right, they talk about therefore the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind at the top. And as we go through here, they talk about once this malady has a real hold, they're a baffled lot. Why are they baffled? Because they can't seem to stay sober for any given period of time. They always return to drinking again. Once this malady has a real hold, they're a baffled lot. That's what places you beyond human aid. The book says that, not I say that. You won't find this talk in treatment centers. They won't get your money if they're talking like this, will they? That, hey, you have a condition that we can't really help you with, but we can make you feel better about the idea, thinking you can do something about it. And then after you relapse, well, I'm sorry, obviously you're, you didn't follow what we were talking about. Well, what is repeated over and over unless this person can inspire an entire psychic change, right? So we see that the only person really f doomed to failure that goes through these facilities is the alcoholic, right? Because these other people can't get sober by working on themselves and support. They come in here and carry their message to us. Us, the alcoholic, tries to do what they're doing, and we keep getting loaded and dying. So the only one really dying in AA is the alcoholic by trying to get sober through their methods and through their ideas that are not book-based. Book it's treatment center-based. That works for people like that. Treatment center is like an assortment center. When they're done with you, they send you to us. And then what we need to do is relearn what was being presented here. So they talk about once this malady, and then they talk about the first obsession is fixing ourselves. Nobody has that here. I know that fine group of people. And then they talk about what they talk about on page 24 is is that we've lost a choice when it comes to the first drink at certain times. 
Then they, they, on page 24 at the bottom, they said, when this sort of thinking, what, what sort of thing? When this malady has a hold, we're real baffled lot. What places us beyond human aid then? Why doesn't acceptance, surrender, and all this terminology, and going to meetings and working on myself, why doesn't it work? Well, because you're of the type of alcoholic that's beyond human aid. It's just a matter of time before you drink again. Your body and brain is damaged beyond the point of where you could fix it on your own resources. Oh, I'm of that. How do I know if I'm that type? Well, how well have you been doing so far? Well, I got three months. I got four years. I got six months. I got fifteen. Well, then, and then you got loaded again. Yeah. So, so you got three months before, and your best effort got you loaded again. But you had three months, so you think you do more of what you did before. You're gonna get better success. What you did before didn't work. If it worked, you'd still be sober. You wouldn't be working on a 24-hour chip again. A 24-hour chip tells you that whatever you were doing before that chip isn't working. Wow, that was deep. Fuck, yeah, here's your chip. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) you done doing it your way? Well, no, not really. I'm going to try harder, okay? We'll wait for you. What's that in your hand? Your next 24-hour chip? <laughs> We're waiting. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, I have these moments. Eh? He's a squirrel. Okay, so coming back, what places us beyond human aid? Page 24. When? Uh, when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. Boom! Isn't that good news? How many people want to do the wave? So they're telling me you're going to get loaded again. Fear of this type. So we go through this thing. We get into more about alcoholism. It talks about, I'm going to kind of fly through this real fast. It talks about on page 30 that most of us have been unwilling to admit we're real alcoholics. No person likes to think he's bodily mentally different from his fellows. So from page 30... To 33, they talk about the allergy because they're talking about what? More about alcoholism, right? And how many symptoms are there in alcoholism? Two, right? We already know it's the allergy and the malady that centers in the mind, right? Most of us have been unwilling to admit that we have this condition of the mind. We're okay with the body, but this condition of the mind, we don't like talking about it and you won't hear it mentioned too much in meetings because that's not what they're told in treatment centers. That's not what they're told with the self-help. That's not what they're told in the 12 and 12. That's not what they're told in the Valgo. But if you go through this book, that's our language. This is how we need to understand it and how we speak, right? So they talk about there's the obsession here. Well, what's the obsession in regards to? The idea that somehow, someday we'll control and enjoy our drinking. We see our terminology in our book That refers to people who have not done step one yet. If you're still obsessing about the idea that you could control and enjoy your drinking, you have not done step one yet, and you don't understand alcoholism. So once you learned, once you got educated, is the purpose of this book is to educate you on what alcoholism is, and you for for you to diagnose yourself whether you have this or not. That's why it talks about here. We learned. We had to fully concede. To concede is different than surrender. Concede means to look at the information being presented. I concur. I concede that I have this thing. Right? So from page 30 to 33, they talk about the allergy. From page 33 to 43, 11 pages. It must be important to talk about the malady that centers in the mind. They talk about, so this, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse in a drinking, for obviously this is the crutch of the problem, right? And so they talk about that on page 35. So we shall describe some of them, and what they talk about is the suddenly, this malady, this phenomena, it's an unexplainable event that just happens suddenly didn't start last week or last month. It means it lies dormant within our thinking, within the center of our mind somewhere. And when it becomes present, we are drinking again. We're without defense against that. Anybody ever experienced that here? Does it say, do you understand it? It says, no, this is what it looks like. And have you exhibit this? Because if you've exhibited it, you're in deep shit. So the best way they describe this thing is actually, if you really want to understand what this thing is that we have, is on page 37. This is the best 
over, overview of the malady in the whole book is on page 32. I, I think that's worth reading. Everybody there? Page 37? This is an overview of step one, the, the second symptom that makes us powerless. Over, if you're powerless over something, acknowledging it doesn't change it. How many people find that surprising? Anybody have dysentery here? How many people's experienced diarrhea here? Come on, be proud. If you sat there and accepted it, what would it do? Nothing. If you surrendered to the fact the people around you wouldn't like it too much, would they? What about letting it go? Don't do that. What you see what I mean? Like when we look at it that way, it's funny. What do you if you have this condition? There's nothing verbally that would change it by my, my looking at it, me bringing it to a meeting, me, right, me, me thinking it through. I mean, nothing changes it, right? We think, that's stupid. Well, just surrender to it. That's, that's crazy. How would that work? We, when, but we use that logic in regards to that kind of problem. Now we talk about alcoholism. Oh, just let it go. Just turn it over. Just surrender. Just have acceptance. That's crazy shit. Where does that shit come from? And we go, well, that kind of makes sense. Because you're not right up here. That's why it makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> 11 years in and out, people. 11 years in and out. Whoa, that's a, that sounds good. <laughs> Welcome back, Tony. Here's your chip. Okay, go ahead. Page 37. Which paragraph? Oh, you. You may think. <laughs> what some of you are doing? <laughs> How many people are here right now? Show of hands. Okay. You may think this an extreme case. To us, it is not far fetched. For this kind of thinking has been characteristic of every single one of us. Just starting drinking. Just anybody have that characteristic here? Everybody running? I thought you were supposed to be sober. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Pass the vodka. <laughs> Anybody have that here? Like, okay. We have sometimes reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences. Anybody? Any reflectors here? Let's think it through. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> right? <laughs> Give me a drink anyways. <laughs> Go ahead. That there was always the curious mental phenomenon that parallel with our sound reasoning, there inevitably... The malady, happened. curious mental phenomena, this unexplainable event that's happening that not even we can see it. Once it ha has us, it has us. We can't see it, it has us, because something sh happens. That's what they're saying. Something shifts so dramatically in, in your brain that you can't even see what you what's happening. You're being governed by something other than you. It's, it's, it's under the category of mental illness. How many people find that surprising that you may be suffering from a mental illness? Some of us get a little... Dig Listen, ask the people around you if they think you're afflicted with a mental illness. Just anybody have people still talking to them from their past or people that knew them in their drinking days? Ask them if they think there's something the matter with you psychologically. Anybody want the confirmation of that? How many people has looked in the mirror here and went, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you go, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody ever talk to themselves in the mirror? You ever wonder who you're talking to or who's asking those questions? Hey, you. I've got to ask you something. Oh, what's that? What's the matter with you? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kimberly. Sorry. <laughs> But there was always the curious mental phenomenon that parallel with our sound reasoning, there inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink. Beautiful. Boom. Nothing explains it better than that. And then as we went through this, they finished the chapter by saying, once more, the alcoholic has no effect. And if you've gone through this, it's pretty awesome. So what is the whole purpose of the first three chapters, the doctor's opinion and a spiritual appendix in the back of the book? Each chapter will tell you the purpose of the chapters before it, right? So we're going to hit it up right on the first page here, page 44. This is a summary of, of the introduction, whether we move on or not, right? Whether we need to move on or not, or we could abandon the idea of, of this pursuit. So what happens is we're now educated on what the problem is, what the solution is, and the book is going to kind of put that all together. 
on the confirmation of those that went before us on the process they went through. This is a summary of everything we just went through. And what's that? Page 44? Yes. We have Oklahoma, we agnostics, chapter 4. Right. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. See how they're talking about you? You have learned, the reader, you. You have learned. Right? So there's a conversation happening here, right? Imagine there's over 100 men and women having a conversation with you. Because that's how many people kind of put this together. And since thousands. So collectively, there's millions of us who have gone through this. This is having basically a conversation with you. Right? They're saying, we hope, right? You have learned. Okay, go ahead. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. That's our job as sponsors. That's our job when we meet new people is to educate them on what is alcoholism and what isn't alcoholism. So far, have they done that in the book? Have they made clear what is alcoholism and what isn't alcoholism? Pretty clear when we follow this, isn't it? Right? If, biggest word in the book... If, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if, when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take. What two symptoms are these? So they're talking about two symptoms here, not three symptoms. That, again, that idea is brought by treatment centers. It's not founded in our book. There's only two symptoms. Here, the first symptom, if you can't stop drinking, what symptom is that? Where's that symptom located? If you can't stop, it's the mind. And what's our terminology around that symptom? What do we call that symptom? We call it the malady, right? This condition that centers in the mind, right? This phenomena, and, and we call it a blank spot, the insanity that precedes the first drink. We don't call it the obsession. That's not our language. That's treatment center language. That's not our language. Has the book called it that? Has the book gave it, given the obsession as an example of the thinking that precedes the first drink in regards to alcoholism? Has the book done that? No. So, so this is where we start having a hard time because we hear so many people in the fellowship talking that way. We must say it's true. Well, what does the book say? The book says no. The obsession is in regards to people who haven't done step one yet. If you've done step one, what we're concurring to, can I keep myself sober based on my own experience? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, then I must be a little bad. Why am I baffled? Why can't I keep myself sober? Because of this malady that centers in the mind, right? And as explained on what page? 37. It's this, this phenomena, this thing that parallels with my sound thinking that fails to keep me in check. True, are we agreed on that or are we not agreed on that? Everybody kind of needs some, yeah, okay, good. So, and then the other one is the allergy. Or when drinking, do you have the amount, like, can you control the amount you drink? Anybody here? Not once in 1947. I mean, consist overall, can I control the amounts I drink? Can I drink without consequence? No, why can't I drink without consequence? Because of the allergy. That's what gets our attention is the consequences. And we find out why we have consequences because of the allergy. If I can't control the amounts I take and I can't stop myself from taking it, now I have a problem. This is what makes me powerless over alcohol. This double-edged sword that they talk about, right? Okay. If, there's that big word again. Three times in that paragraph. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Again, where did we hear that from? Who endorsed that idea? The doctor. The doctor. So if there was, how many people hear other things as a solution in AA to our problem? How many people on those sites? We, Joe and I, we put up on, on there, um, what is the solution to step one? Just don't pick up. Surrender. Acceptance. Like all, so... In regards to those things, how many times have we read that's the solution, our solution, alcoholism and Alcoholics Anonymous is surrender? How many people have read that so far? How many people has read acceptance? How many people has read surrender? Is surrender in here so far? No. So we see we use specific terminology for a reason. 
right? Because we're dealing with life and death here. And they're saying this is so serious that the only thing that will save you from you is this entire psychic change. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is built on, right? Because if there was another way of doing it, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Bill would have found another way of doing it. Right? Ebby would have found another way of doing it. The first 100 men and women would have found another way of doing it because they had all these people involved in their lives trying to help them find a way to, to, to kind of rebuild their lives. But they kept on getting drunk. Anybody have that problem here? Alcoholics Anonymous is designed for relapsers. How many people find that surprising? Right? Otherwise, we'd have meetings at Burger King. Right, so so you, you know, we see you got a coupon. I got a coupon. Hey? So you know it's kind of like it's not drive-through recovery here. You can't have it your way and and have what we have. You can't have it your way. It's not your program. It's our program. If you want what we have, then this is what we're doing. If you have this problem, then you're going to need this specific solution. This is our understanding of the problem, the solution, and the course of our... None of it's yours. The only thing you're bringing to the table is your broken story. That's what you're bringing to the table. Do you want a solution to that story? And it's not your solution. It's our solution to your broken story. We have a new solution for you, right? We have a new story for you. How many people have a new story since coming here? Could you have created the story that Alcoholics Anonymous gave you? There's no way you could have. That's why I said if you want collectively. And what does it say? To one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. But to continue as he is means disaster. Anybody, anybody here means disaster to continue on? How many people here is family, friends, and the people around you looking forward to your next drink? How many people looking forward to you showing up at the next family get-together? How many people, you know, it's taken a little while for you to even, for them to even take your calls within the first six rings? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You ever notice the more you ruin your life, the longer it took people to answer your calls and the more it went to voicemail? Yeah, how many people notice that? I didn't know that. Then I got so, I have people joke, holy smokes, you answered it on the first ring. Yeah, because I don't got money to lend you and we're not related. What's up? <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it means disaster. To continue as he is means disaster, especially if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. The one who has the malady. Not everybody is of that type, so they could afford to do other things. But we, our types, need a specific solution. Otherwise, we perish. And that's what they'll, they'll kind of reemphasize that and reemphasize. We need to learn our language and bring this language back to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. When we're talking with sponsors, we need to talk about a specific language that they'll pass on to other people. Never mind none of that feng shui shit that we hear that doesn't work for people like us. You want to burn incense and ring chimes? Do that somewhere else. That doesn't happen here. It's not for us. Did I say that out loud? Or was it, let me in sideways. Did I? Did, yeah. am I oh my God, I'm, I'm unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> to be doomed an alcoholic death. Not, not, what step is that? To be doomed to an alcoholic death. What step is that? Step one. Step one. Nothing changes that in step one. Nothing of your own power changes that. The only solution we have to offer to step one's fate is what? A psychic change or spiritual experience, which is step two. If there was something else that changed step the fate of step one, don't you think they would have said it by now? Do you think they would have said it by now? How many people were hoping there was another part to this thing other than what they were offering? Ah, come on, can't be that bad. Well, yeah, it is that bad, right? Okay. To be doomed an alcoholic death. Step or one. To, yep. One. Yep. Step one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Or, or to live life on a spiritual basis step are not two. always yep. easy alternatives to face. But it isn't so difficult. About half our original fellowship were of exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, 
Hoping against hope, we were not true alcoholics. Why? Because if we're not a true alcoholic, then I don't need to say get changed, and I really don't need to do this process in the book. All I need to do is go to meetings and talk about how great I am keeping me sober and how much I'm working on myself. I'm working on this defect. I'm working on that defect. I put up some candles in my place. I bought a cat. Uh, my life's so fantastic. I got some plants. My goldfish not doing so well, but I mean, I'm, you know, like, I'm so happy to be here. If you want what I got, I'm willing to come to the fish store with me and then... Home Depot to get you some plants of fish and all. Like, like, come on, right? The, you hear that shit in meetings and you're sitting, you're dying of alcohol as you're going, do I gotta get a goldfish? <laughs> <laughs> because we're nuts when we get here. We're sick, we're dying, and we'll do anything. And that makes sense. Okay, I'll get a goldfish. Okay, I'll get a goldfish. Uh, I got a plan. Want me to get a plan? I'll get a plan. Okay. Want me to watch 28 Days Sober? Okay, I'll watch 28 Days Sober. Okay. Want me to stay out of a relationship? I can't do that. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what an order! I can't go through with it. <laughs> hey, that's the only time we'll say. Where does it say that? No relationships in the first year. Everything else, okay, okay, okay. No relationships. Where does it say that? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> that's the only thing we question, right? Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, but after a while, we had to face the facts that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Or else what? We're going to die an alcoholic death. We have two alternatives. There's no door number three. So what's in the way here is our understanding. Do we understand what they mean by a spiritual experience or psychic change or this power or this God yet? Do we understand what they're bringing to the table as an understanding? of their solution yet. Do we understand what they're talking about in regards to That's what this chapter is together. Notice if it was just about God or spirit, then they would say, well, why don't you go with your own ideas? You notice they haven't started this, this chapter with that or start with your own understanding? Have you noticed they haven't used that word yet? Why? Because you need to understand what we're talking about. You need to understand our solution. And from there, you could choose your own conception of what that means to you. But it's our understanding of our solution as we understand it. This is our solution that we're offering as a solution to alcoholism that we all agree on. Now you could twist it to understand it of your own conception, but in order to have your own conception, you need to understand what we're talking about first. Is that true or false? If you're gonna take a conception from something, you need to understand the conversation, don't you? And have they had that yet? No, that's what they're gonna have. So they're saying, Relax, whether you're atheist, agnostic, or true believer, we're all having the same problem here. We can't find a way to stay sober. All three people are having the same dilemma. Have you noticed that? The true believer, the atheist, and the agnostic. There's something that not enabling them to have this psychic change or spiritual experience sufficient enough for them to recover. There's something the matter with their process or their belief system or the way they see things that are standing in the way of this experience that we're offering here. Right? Are we agreed or not agreed? We agreed. So let's see. Now we're going to expand on that idea. There's something inside of you that's stopping you from seeing things differently. Let's work around. Let's see if we could work around that like Bill did. Well, I mean, Ebby did with Bill. Remember? He was sitting at the kitchen table. He couldn't get past his own thinking. And Ebby said, why don't you choose your own conception? That's after he explained his experience to him about this power. And Bill said it was only a matter of being willing to believe that there was a power grid. And to do simple things, I could build what I saw in my friend. He, he believed that there was something. And if he did what his friend did, he could get what his friend got. Are we agreed on that? That's what happened. So that's what we're at with this process here. Okay. Perhaps it is going to be that way with you, but cheer up. Something like <laughs> half of us thought we were atheists or agnostics. Our experience shows that you need not be disconcerted. Okay, Even so here, what they're going to talk about here is if working on yourself and all this bumper sticker sobriety stuff worked, then we wouldn't need to go on. So look at the wording here. It's very interesting what they're going to talk about and how they perceive this thing. Go ahead. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, 
many of us would have recovered long ago. I'm working on my old behaviors. Some of my old behaviors have come up. That's that idea. Oh, I'm working on myself. I'm working on these behaviors. Right? Well, then you don't understand alcoholism. And if they're, and you hear people say, I'm working, some of these old behaviors are come back. If they've come back, they're not old behaviors, are they? Sorry, I had to go there. Okay. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us. Surrender, no acceptance, much- pray for them, let it go, turn it over. Blah, all the sticker shit sobriety that you hear that just kills people. Gives you the delusion of something, but it actually does nothing. What it does is make you comfortable in your seat till the drink returns. Right? You're comfortable in your seat sitting in the airport thinking you're going somewhere, but you have no itinerary, you have no manual, and you're sitting there waiting for something to happen. There's only one thing that happens in AA, and that's another drink. That's the only thing that just happens. In, don't leave before the miracle happens. You know why they say that? Don't leave till somebody could 12 step you into this thing. I know there's more of you than us. Don't leave till the miracle happens. This is the miracle carrying this message to the alcoholic who still suffer. That's the only miracle that happens in AA. Unless this message gets carried to you, you will die an alcoholic death sitting in Alcoholics Anonymous. If that don't make you a little upset, I don't know what will. Like when you think about that, guys like sitting in the fellowship of all for 11 years, puking green bile, dying of alcoholism, trying to get sober on all this shit that we hear in here that has nothing to do with AA. But I don't know that. And the people who are helping me don't know that. Right? And then those guys who introduced me to this blew my mind. Blew my mind. And they took me through. If you, I went through this kicking and screaming. Like, I mean, like... I'm not the fine specimen of a human being you see before you today. Uh, like there was deterioration. There was there was like a, there was a lot of muttering to myself and kind of watching things fly around the room for a little while. It was really good when other people started seeing it too. My sponsor said when I kind of moved real fast, he says it's okay. We see that too, Tony. Relax. I'd hear voice people calling me. I'd look back in the meeting and realize I'm sitting up against the back wall. Like I mean nuts, nuts, baby, nuts. But if you ask me, kind of good. I'm working on myself. So yeah, acceptance, surrender, learning. That just batshit crazy. The only people that don't know they're crazy is crazy people. Anybody ever notice that? Anybody watch Jack Nicholson here? One flew over the cuckoo's nest. You know when they're all sitting on the bus, they don't know they're crazy. They're really buying into this. That's like the process we're in now. We're, we're saying, get on the bus. Just, but I don't have a ticket. Just get on the bus. This, like this is get on the bus, but but get on the bus. Just get on the bus. This is the vehicle that's going to take you fishing to have a new experience, right? Remember when they went fishing and the whole that's kind of new life, and that's what we're kind of offering is a whole new experience here. Anyway, I don't know why I digressed there and went that way, but anyway, welcome back. Hi, my name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. Okay, go ahead. Um, we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact. We could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Why? Because we can't create this site to change your spiritual experience, right? And so hopefully that you've read this somewhere along the line, the spiritual appendix in the back of the book, where they talk about here, what is that, five what? 567 if you kind of look at that page here they talk about and we're going to hit like because you should be reading this stuff alone we're going to hit some highlights here but they talk about this change that they're talking about here is that we couldn't bring about by ourselves so when they talk about the spiritual experience and they kind of go through this here but we're going to hit this which is kind of i think one of the profound parts of this thing among our rapidly growing fellow membership you want to kind of hit us up on that page 567 and hopefully you've read this stuff and your sponsor have read it or you've gone through it we're going to hit the highlights here right what the gist of this thing is okay among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics such transformations though frequent are by no means the rule most of our experiences are what the psychologist william james calls the educational variety because they develop slowly over a period of time. So what does, what does that period of time mean? We, we don't know. 
that could be very in love. They'll clarify what that very that period of time is that creates this psychic change or spiritual experience. One is sudden, right? The, the, the most sickest people in AA get those, right? The sudden, like an intervention that gets enough shift in your brain where you could begin this process. I I have experienced that at different times, but I never got through the process. So what happens is the insanity of alcohol would return. So one sudden, right, and one happens like what they're talking about. And those who usually experience the sudden one can't wait for this other side. I don't know how that happens. It just happens and explains it more there. So anyway, so let's see what a period of time means according to this thing. Okay, go ahead. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. Usually the newcomer is going around trying to convince everybody how much they changed. Anybody here? Don't have to put up your hands. But, right? We're, oh, I've changed, I've changed. Well, we're waiting. Don't worry. The people around you will be the first to notice when you change. You don't need to tell them again. Because every time you go up to them and say how much you changed, they brace themselves and grab their wallets because they know it's going to cost them money. Sorry. <laughs> I've really changed this time. You got a 20? <laughs> no, <go ahead. laughs> he finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life. That such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. Here we go. Ready? Highlight this. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. And why can't we... Wait years for the self-discipline part. Why can't we just keep working on ourselves for years? Because the malady keeps taking us out. We can't afford to go too long without this change. If this change doesn't happen, the insanity of the first drink returns. And the longer we get away from the drink, the more we think we got this under control. Because we start feeling better instead of getting better, and we don't understand alcoholism, and we have the delusion that based on how I'm feeling, I'm going to be okay. Right? I said to myself, self, do you want a drink today? Just remind yourself you're an alcoholic every, every morning. Just remind yourself like that that's not our solution. Because if reminding yourself, if you're able to stay sober by doing step one, then step one doesn't apply to you. Make sense? Because how many times did it ask you to remind yourself every morning that you're an alcoholic to stay sober? You're, it's doomed to failure. It will not work, right? Okay, which usually takes place in a few um, months, right? Okay, go ahead. Uh, with few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource. So that's a collective experience, is it not? With few exceptions, right? There are exceptions to the rule, right? So here they're saying collectively, this is all our experience, that we've all tapped into an inner resource of strength that we've got access to this process, right? And go ahead. Most of us think this awareness... Oh, sorry, back it up. Which presently identify with their own, own conception, conception of a power greater than themselves. And they explain it in their own wording, what it means to them, but it's the same experience of all of them having it. So all of us would sit here and describe our... Everybody, how many people own a cell phone here? Everybody own a cell phone? So as if you started describing your cell phone and my cell, we're describing the same thing, but you're using your own language, how you use and the things that you find beneficial with your phone. We're undescribed. The secondary, whether it's a Samsung, an iPhone, or a secondary, the basis of it is the same. Is it not? And we'd all basically have the same conversation in describing it, right? Okay, go ahead. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of wife. spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most empathetically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover. Provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. Sorry, in whose experience? Hours. Hmm. Right again, right? So if you did it 
the way they're talking about in their experience, would you become a part of that collective? It would be our experience, not my experience. This is our experience. This is our solution. If you want what we have, it's available to who? Anybody willing to do this thing. Right? Okay. Um, he can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one needs to have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery, but these are indispensable. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. So what, what are the ingre main ingredients to obtaining this thing? Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. Anybody remember having a combination lock in school? They give you the numbers? These are, these are the numbers. But how do I, do I put them in application? The left, the right, does that, that's missing from that sequence to unlock the lock, the spiritual combination lock. That's what the rest of the book is about. So if we go back based on that idea there, that through this process, we could have this thing that all our members, with a few exceptions, have experienced this thing is available to anybody. And it's a change sufficient enough for us to recover from alcoholism. That's what's being offered, right? Because if we don't recover from this thing and get the psychic change or spiritual experience, what's our fate? We're doomed to an alcoholic death. They didn't say when that would happen, but they said it's going to happen. When you know you're in a collision course with another drink, it's going to motivate you a little more than the idea that you're going to stay sober based on your own experience. Most people think they'll never drink again. They don't understand step one. When you understand I have a daily reprieve from that fate, I don't fear it, but I understand it, that I need to maintain certain ideas and principles and a relationship with something greater than myself so alcoholism doesn't return. It gets removed. I'm no longer suffering from alcoholism today. I have a solution for my human dilemma. As long as I'm practicing these principles to my human uh, um, experience, I don't have to worry about alcoholism returning as a solution to my problem anymore. I have a new way of looking at it, and we'll cover that. Go ahead here. So on our own resources, marshaled by the will, we could see that we can't create this change within our psyche sufficient enough to remove this malady that centers in it because we can't see, feel, and touch it, right? If we could see, feel, and touch it, then we could do something about it. But if you have an illness that has you and you don't have it, now we have a problem, right? Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where, how were we to find this power? Well, so, so now they're saying it's something, they call it a power, that, and they're going to explain what they mean by that. A lot of people say, oh, you got to find God in step two and start talking about their relationship with God in step two. That's not step two. Step two is the solution to step one. What is the solution to step one? Is the psychic change of spiritual experience that we obtain through getting access to a power. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So I need to find out what they mean by that. So they're going to talk about the solution that's available to us in step two that they talked about earlier when two members of Alcoholics Anonymous went and visited this guy. They outlined the problem. Then they outlined the solution that they found through a course of action. The doctor talked about that also, is obtaining certain ideas that these people put into practice, enabling them to have this experience. So where and how were we to find this, this experience? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. His main object is to enable who? You, to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem, or help you solve your problem? Solve all your problems. Big difference, right? Because if this power needs your help to fix you, then you it, it ain't going to be good enough because you're always going to be in the way. So this thing is the same thing that Bill talked about, the same thing Abby talked about, and, and the first 100 men and women. They've tapped into this thing that solved all their problems. The internal shift sufficient enough to have this experience that they talked about as a spiritual appendix in the back of the book, a transformation in our ideas. So as we go through this, 
they talk about here, we're going to kind of talk about on page 47 here. No, I'm sorry, page 46. Yes, we have alcoholic uh, agnostic temperament. You want to read that through? Sure. Can I add something just to those powers on 45? Do you mind? What, what did you want to add? Well, if you notice, for those bookwormy types, the first three powers have a lowercase, and then we switch to a capital P. So we're going from a verb to a noun. So the verb is relating to utilizing strength, which is our personal strength, which we don't have. And then we switch to a noun, which is the authority, the command, the ability to influence of the capital P. Awesome. Yeah. Beautiful. A little, little nerdy stuff. Nerdy stuff, right on. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Okay, yes, we of agnostic temperaments have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us make haste to reassure you. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results. So what is that saying is my experience with this is because I come from a a uh, charismatic Nazarene Baptist background, right? Like I, I was real, like the ideas that were presented. I was so plagued with these ideas, built like like on and on different times. Too long of a story to get into. When I got to this stage, was I don't know who or what you are, but I know there's something out there. I need a new experience. Can you help me to lay aside everything I thought I knew? So I could have a new experience that we do with the set aside prayer. Because everything I knew was killing me and was getting in the way of what was being presented here. I couldn't get past my own thinking. How many people are able to get past their own thinking here? How many people get stuck on their own thinking here? How many people get stuck on other people's thinking or teachings in regards to what these things mean? So they're saying here, if I could just put all that crap I have in my mind aside for a second. Because... My life depends on me getting the psychic change or spiritual experience. Yes or no? Yes. So I mean, I can't afford to hang on some of these ideas that are killing me or some of these other people's teaching. I need a new experience. I need this change that I can't create. So here, there's to, to lay aside prejudice and even, even express a willingness to believe. Even a willingness to believe. That's it. A willingness to believe is the start of this thing. Like, how much, like, this is really, really wild. I love this part. Okay, go ahead. Uh, even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results. Even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. True, right? I mean, when you think about it, if you took a dot, if anybody have a pen here? And you took a dot and you put it on a piece of paper and you looked at that dot. That dot takes up more room on this earth than you do in, in the universe. And you're going to tell me you know what? What do you know? What do you know? <laughs> that dot takes up more room on this planet earth than you do in compared to the universe. When you look at that, when you think about it, it's kind of mind blowing. So let's figure, let's figure out the universe, God, energy, and power. Uh how long are you on this earth? Oh, about maybe 80, 90 years if I'm lucky. 90 years. How long the earth been here and this galaxy and all that? Um, well, let's have a conversation about God. It's like two ants arguing about humans. I don't think there's such a thing. <laughs> My shadow still believes there's no such thing as the sun. Okay, go ahead. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. So here we go. So you can have your own conception of God. So now they're going to clarify it. Ready? Ready for this? The bottom line to this thing. Because my conception was when I got here, like God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost... And, and laying on of hands, talking, and like all that stuff. I have the basis of all that stuff still in the back of my mind to be born. Like all that stuff was that was my conception that I brought to the table here, along with a, a lot of other things that kind of got in the way of, of my expanding on this thing. But the bottom line is, all my teachings, all my belief weren't sufficient enough for me to experience this psychic change in order for me to recover. 
right? All my pursuit of self and looking for those was enough to give an example of that guy earlier, even though his religious teachings, right, were, were a lot, they weren't, they didn't spell the necessary spiritual experience. That's what they're kind of getting at. So yeah, you can have all these different ideas, conception, and we're not going to get into the debate about that, about this, this, and the other thing. So we need to find the bottom line here then. What is the bottom line? As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power. That was a lower case there, right? Eh? Power, yeah. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs> and direction, provided we took other simple steps. <clears throat> Again, what is yeah. this book as well? It enables us to find this power that they're talking about so we can have our own experience with it, provided we do other things. So the singular acts that we hear in these meetings and people tell you the singular uh, acceptance, surrender, these singular things is not enough for us because we won't be able to maintain this way of life and develop and grow from those singular acts. We need to find something that creates this change that we can grow from and develop because if we don't, we start working toward our own demise again without realizing it. Go ahead. We found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, and all-inclusive. So Never on page on page 20, sorry, on page 47, we're going to hit this up here, like hit some highlights. You should read this. You saw, honestly, and see where you're at with this stuff because this hits three different people. Right? It hits, so I'm trying to hit the, the thread of this thing. Because it, it's talking to the agnostic, the true believer, and, 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 and the atheist. So whatever your problems is, you need to kind of navigate through that, going through this, where you could find this, the basis of the basis that they're talking about here. As soon as, right? That's the basis. We need to ask. There's questions here that ask the book asks us to ask us. Go ahead. We need need to ask ourselves but one short question do i now believe or am i even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself as soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe we empathetically assure him that he is on his way awesome on page 50 in our personal stories and then this reiterates what I was talking about, uh, about questions each person has to ask for themselves. Go ahead. In our personal stories, you will find a wide variation in the way each teller approaches and conceives of the power which is greater than himself. Whether we agree with a particular approach or conception seems to make little difference. I just lost my page. Experience has taught us that these are matters about which, for our purpose, we need not be worried. They are questions for each individual to settle for himself. On one proposition, however, these men and women are strikingly agreed. Every one of them has gained access to and believes in a power greater than himself. This power has in each case accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. As a celebrated American statesman put it, let's look at the record. So here they're talking about, when we're talking about step two, all of us talk about the same experience and understanding. It's, it's not different. Like when you're talking about the solution here, the solution is we gain access to a power greater than ourselves. That's the basis of this thing. What you call it in your own conception is personal to you. That's none of our business. Nor does it have a place in, in the fellowship as endorsing your understanding on us. The basis of it is this is how we understand it. We got lack of power was our dilemma. Right? We had to get access to a power. Why? To create this change within inside of the psychic change or spiritual experience. Because lack of power is our dilemma to create this change. Well, where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. And so they're saying here that all of us have the same dilemma. What's all of our dilemma? Lack of power. 
to create this change because I need this change in order to recover. Well, where and how am I to find this power that creates this change? Well, that's what this book is about. So again, if I do what they do, I'd be talking the same way they're talking. Now, what my experience, my conception, what my practices today, 31 years later, is a lot different than it was to make my beginning. My job as a sponsor and a guide is to allow other people to make their beginning to find their way through this book so they can have the same spiritual experience. What they choose to do with that is entirely up to them, and that's in steps 10 and 11 stuff. But the basis of this thing, my job as a recovered alcoholic, is to allow people to find the basis of this thing that they could find this power that creates the change with inside of them also, not to pass on my conceptions and my ideas to the new person. That's part of my responsibility. But if they ask me, I'll tell them my convictions and my belief. I won't, I won't shy away from it, but I won't try to pass that off as that's what they need to have. Does that kind of make sense? Go ahead. Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude toward that power and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. In the face of collapse and despair, in the face of the total failure of their human resources, they found that a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Again, through the process, the experience came as the result of the process, not beforehand. A lot of people talk about all these changes before the process happened. Oh, I've just done step one. Oh, this thing happened. Oh, I just did step two. Oh, this thing happened. I just did step three. This thing happened. They're saying this thing happens as the result of these steps, not beforehand. Right? Because when this thing happens, guess what we need? We stop working on it because it's happened. Here's your chip. Right? Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Once confused and baffled by the seeming futility of existence, they show the underlying reasons why they were making heavy going of life. Leaving aside the drink question, they tell why living was so unsatisfactory. They show how the change came over them. When many hundreds of people are able to say that the consciousness of the presence of God is today the most important facts of their lives, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. So when they talk about the consciousness, they talk about this experience that they had, where it moved from their thinking into their, an experience with inside of themselves. So this week, read from page 52 to... 50, I'll even give you a hint, to 57, but somewhere in there it'll tell us where the solution lies. Because if we know where we want to go, which is a psychic change or spiritual experience, that's where we want to end up. It's like when I when I leave my place and, and my wife and I make a plan to get to Harrison Hot Springs, that's where we want to end up. But what's the route that gets me there? What's the basis? Where do I start from? Right? Anybody ever have a GPS here? How many people has operated a GPS? So the first thing you'll do, you'll do is punch in where you want to go. So what we'll do is we'll punch in psychic change, spiritual experience, right? Solution alcohol. We're punching that in the GPS. So we know where we want to go. What will the GPS then do? It, it, it needs to do something in order to get you to that location. And every time you get off track, it'll bring you back to the specific location. And that's what you'll discover in the next couple pages. So this week, find out where the basis of the reallocating of the GPS always returns back to, or where's the beginning of this thing? Where's the start of this thing in order to get me to Harrison Hodgman or the psychic change or spiritual experience? Where does it begin? That's your, that's your kind of uh, homework for the week. Right? So find out where it is and underline it. Right? And that'll be awesome. Joe? Right on. That was awesome, guys. What a meeting. Um, we got about a minute left. Um, you know, thanks for coming out. Uh, if, you guys, if you guys are passionate about this big book and, and the big book study workshop sheets, 
email me, send this uh, link out to, to friends or people that you know in your groups that may be suffering that want the, the right understanding. Like that's, that's our job, right? Is to carry what the book is saying, the actual message to help others still suffer, right? And so most people that I, I invite here are people that really want to stop drinking. Other than that, if, uh, if they're not able to make it, you can always send them the YouTube talks that we have. Uh, the channel is Tony R. Vancouver. Uh, if you want big book study workshop sheets, I put my email up in the chat. Uh, I'll put it up again. You can also find them on the YouTube channel. If you want to join the Facebook group, Kim, uh, I don't know why I can't remember the own Facebook group. What's the name of it, Kim? The big book step study discussion workshop. Workshop. Yeah, so type that in. We'll, we'll, it's a private group. If you want to get into more book-based, we ask a lot of good questions in there, kind of like, not like trivia. It's not meant to irritate. It's meant to show a little humility. Like, hey, what are they saying? I haven't seen that yet. And different levels of different spiritual progress on that page. It's pretty awesome. So anyway, thanks for coming out. And, we have a seven uh, tradition. Della, Della had been posting it through. Oh, it? Oh, okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Della had been posting it through. We got our homework for the week, which is awesome. Uh, sorry, I got a little excited tonight, but I mean, I had fun. Hopefully, everybody else had fun, and, and it was a, a good meeting. And, uh, and yeah, remember Rule 62, and, and if you think I'm a little disturbed, pray for me. The more you pray for me, the better I get honest. Try it this week, okay? And also, uh, Adam Luna, he's going to post up his information right now. He does a, through the Keystone Group, Monday night meeting. He's going to put that up in the chat. Also, Sunday mornings at 11.15, same ID number, uh, another big book study workshop, more uh, newcomer base, more geared towards step one and what that looks like. And and yeah, so other than that, we'll close with what, the third step or the serenity? Serenity prayer. It'll be great, Joe. Thanks. But God. I'm in the serenity. To accept, accept the things, things I, I cannot change, change. The, the courage to change the things, things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. May the force be with you. Live long and prosperous. You guys are awesome.